Great. I think we'll I think we'll kick off. I'm sure people are going to carry on drifting in, but that's that's completely fine. Um, I'm going to kick off by by welcoming everybody. And uh, this is this is our next conversation. We're trying to do these every Thursday, just because I think and, and trying to do them in, in different ways with different people. Uh, it's a, it's different this week because I'm co-hosting with Ollie Little, who is in his final year as an MM. L student, although in your, in your year abroad, you, you were a journalist, weren't you? So, you? so he's going to be very, 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 very talented at doing this. Um, particular welcome to, to Greg Nance, who's our, who's our sort of guest tonight. Um, he's going to share a really quite a personal tale with us. And I think it's fair to say through his openness and his athletic endeavour, Greg's helping to shine a light on America's addiction epidemic that we've probably all read about, but, but we, we're really going to hear it clearly from him. I think also it's fair to say with what we're, what we're all going through at the moment, his coping mechanisms might well provide wider ideas for us too. Um, Greg is now 32, read an MPhil in management at FITS, graduating eight years ago, and co-founded and led Money Think and the Diet Men Mentorship, which are organizations that have helped students earn over 27 million pounds in scholarships, which is absolutely amazing. And you've been widely recognized, I know quite rightly, Greg, by, by Obama, by NASDAQ, Wall Street Journal, Harvard Business Review and others. And I think your passion from access comes from being helped through university by scholarships. So it's, it, again, that's really real to you. Um, he's also a sponsored ultra marathon runner um, completed seven marathons in seven days on seven continents in February 2019 and now is running 3,000 miles across the US from New York to Seattle to highlight the 40 million American people and families who are affected by drug and alcohol addiction. Greg will, will tell us the story as we, as, as we go through the next hour, but some of you may have seen the sort of preview on the FITS website uh, which was there earlier this week, where you, I think you detailed your struggles with, with opiate painkillers really, really honestly for us. Um, and I'm really pleased that, to hear that you've been clean for seven and a half years, which is, which is wonderful. Um, Ollie also has, has stuff to share with us, as well as, as, well as co-hosting and interviewing this evening. He, I'm also going to make sure he talks to us as well, because Ollie's also a keen rugby player and powerlifter, but is also very focused on making sure that even with our gym closed, <laughs> that we're going to stay active. Um, and I think can share some thoughts about how exercise can help get people through the current period. So that'll be really good to hear as well. So I'm going to kick off with one question and then I'm going to hand over to Ollie actually to take us forward. So I just wanted to ask <laughs> very straightforwardly to Greg, why are you running 3000 miles across America? What's, what's the plan and why are you doing it? Yeah, th thank you for the uh, the kind words, the sweet introduction there, and grateful for everyone uh, making it out here on a Thursday evening. Um, I know you could be literally anywhere um, on your dorm surfing the net, and you're here, so I, uh, I'm thankful for it. Um, I am running from New York to Seattle uh, because it's a longtime dream of mine that actually came to be uh, as I was running repeats on Castle Hill down the road from Fitz uh, back in the autumn of 2011, I was going through a really hard time personally, uh, where I had achieved every dream in my life. I was a scholarship student getting my MPhil. I'm at Fitz here at Cambridge. This is amazing. And yet I feel empty. I feel lonely. Uh, I, I feel like I'm in pain. And uh, in the course of that, I was making a lot of self-destructive uh, decisions, including drug and alcohol abuse. And I, I really caught the free fall by, by thinking that someday I want to achieve great things in my life and I'm not going to be able to do that if I'm drinking and drugging. I can't, I can't do both. I have to pick. And a dream that kind of came to light during all this was running across America. And it was just a big thing that I kind of came to my brain. Uh, and I knew that I can only do that if I'm able to quit alcohol and drugs. And that, uh, that was the sort of genesis. But over time, I've realized that I wasn't alone in struggling with this. 40 million Americans are struggling with drug and alcohol abuse. And I want to use the run to try to pay it for it, to actually help folks get into recovery, to help young people avoid addiction in the first place with better mental health coping mechanisms. And that's really the mission uh, that we're seeking. Um, and I'm going to bore all of y'all with, with more detail if you're, if you're curious later on in our conversation. Thank you very much indeed, Greg. Ollie, I'm going to hand over to you. Why don't you take us forward for the next bit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I just want to reiterate the Masters thanks and all our thanks to you, Greg, for being here. Um, 
I think it's a wonderfully in interesting topic and particularly pertinent with everything that's going on. So I hope that for everyone on the call, stuff you have to say, maybe even stuff I have to say will be somewhat useful. Um, I want to start by talking about the 3,000 mile run, but more about the practicality of it. Mm -hmm. Because obviously it sounds like an incredibly daunting prospect to anyone who's even, well, tried a 5K, which where there was a movement of that earlier this year in the United Kingdom. How are you going to go about each week? Yeah, so the when you think about a 3,000 mile run, it feels totally impossible, right? It's like, how would you even do that? That's, that's not possible. Uh, and if you think about running 45 miles in a day, that's hardly more possible. That's still too much. Uh, when you think about, hey, in an hour, I need to run four or five miles. Okay, cool. That's starting to feel a little bit more possible. And then in the next moment, I need to take the next step. Um, and that's really where I'll be living throughout this, this journey is taking the next step over and over and over again, finding a rhythm. And then uh, for me, I love to eat. Um, and all that I know you do too. So like, for me, it's like, when's the next meal? And like, that's kind of what my brain is wrapping around. Like, I only need to do this for another two hours and then I get a hot dog. Um, and so I think that's mentally how I'll go about it. That's the reward is getting some food, getting some good, you know, Gatorade down the hatch uh, every little bit and to keep, keep yourself fueled and moving forward. And people along the way, I would presume, you're not gonna be doing 3,000 3, miles totally solo. Totally, yeah, I'm gonna have a crew with me in an RV driving along that'll actually be helping to film like these beautiful landscapes uh, that we're passing. And then I'm gonna share a, a GPS link so that folks that have you know, heard about us passing through their town can actually come out, ride a bike or run uh, alongside me. And that's really gonna be so critical because you get bored in tears pretty quick just running by yourself and so it, it'll be really nice to have folks out there and have some conversations and just enjoy it. there's a lot of beauty along this path too and obviously there's a sense of accomplishment accomplishment when it comes to completing something like that but there's a concrete goal that being the documentary film that's coming with it tell us a little bit about that yeah so i uh we're aiming to shift the dialogue around addiction and um you know i i only lived in the uk for a year so i can't speak uh in any depth there, but I know at least in the USA, there is a lot of stigma around addiction. Um, there's almost this like uh, kind of like moral judgment. If, if someone has suffered from addiction, they must be from a bad family or they're from the wrong side of the tracks or they're a, you know, a weak person or, you know, there's a lot of misconception around that. Uh, we're just now getting a lot of new scientific evidence that has confirmed what many of us have kind of felt all along, which is, hey, that wasn't really a, there was no moral choice to that. It was, it's a biological condition. And it's one that, especially if you're not treating people with like empathy and compassion, it's really hard to acknowledge that you have a challenge that you're working through, that you have a problem, and then to get help. And so part of our goal with the documentary is to show how addiction actually affects people from all walks of life, uh, no matter how successful no matter how much education, how much money you make, no matter where you live, what kind of family, what kind of faith, um, it can affect you. And it does affect people from you know, every cross section. And the documentary, our goal really is to inform and inspire, uh, because a lot of people actually don't really know that. Um, and many people feel totally alone. I did, you know, for seven years, I was, I was struggling, but I, I'm from like a nice town. I'm from a little island off Seattle, where you don't see the stuff like and it only after I've kind of acknowledged like here's what I was going through I've had friends across like the table over lunch or a coffee start crying and it's like whoa like you know are you okay and they're saying I was going through the same thing um, but like I just I didn't feel like I could tell anyone and that's the state of affairs in America right now and it's it's a shame because that is not a way to build a healthy society that's not a way to to, you know, we're one of the most you know, wealthiest countries in the world, and yet that is a massive failing. And my hope, uh, and this is probably a, maybe too big of a hope, but the hope is that this documentary can help people have conversations around dinner tables and eventually help policymakers, those that can actually, you know, marshal huge resources to better uh, support folks going through addiction. And again, getting to youth mental health so that less people uh, take those initial steps in the first place because actually it's a lot easier to help someone before they've started abusing you know hard drugs than it is um, after of course mm -hmm. and you're you're incredibly open about your addiction something which is very admir admirable because it can be a really tough thing to talk about it was painkiller addiction which 
you know, to me just shows that it can come in so many different forms, doesn't it? It, it does. Yeah. For me, it started with alcohol. So yeah, I was 16, uh, had lost my granddad and uh, just didn't have the maturity to deal with that in healthier ways. So uh, yeah, began drinking malt liquor and I don't know if folks are familiar. It's very, very cheap. It's like less than $2 for 40 ounces. And when you're a 16 year old on a landscaping salary, that's, that's the go-to. Um, but yeah, it, it graduates from there. And we have a huge uh, problem in the United States with uh, opiate painkillers are very widely available because of a couple of companies have been massively exploitive and just flooded the market. And so uh, we would actually steal from my friend's dad, who was a doctor, and he has literally thousands of, you know, hundreds of pill bottles all around. He'll never even notice these are gone. And uh, these are also very addictive. They're, it's a derivative of, uh, of heroin. And so it's, uh, it's basically like commercializable heroin is what it amounts to. And it's uh, highly addictive. And the, the challenge is that uh, it's so widely available. You can get a prescription very easily if you just claim, hey, I've got some pain, um, or you can just take it from someone who has that prescription and they can, of course, get more. So it's a it's a huge issue and we're slowly reckoning with that. You know, Pur Purdue Pharmaceutical, the group that has been most abusive, just got hit with a multi-billion dollar uh, uh, fine that was levied. And that doesn't solve the problem, but at least that's taking a step to to crack down on more of these really exploitive um, kind of trafficking practices. It's, it's legal drug dealing is what it amounts to. And it's uh, most folks haven't realized how addictive a lot of this stuff is. So yeah, it's, it's a big issue. And it's one of many that are really kind of interrelated in the States right now. It's a massive issue. And obviously within that relapsing is also a massive issue. Um, I think, you know, relapsing is commonplace when it comes to addiction. I think over half of all people, addiction sufferers relapse at some point in their life. Um, you obviously used running as a coping mechanism, but the day you finished the 777, which for those that don't know, Greg ran seven marathons in seven continents in seven days, which is just ridiculous. Um, you finished it and then you, one of the first things you did was you called your dealer. Yeah, it's, uh, it's one of these things where, you know, I spent two plus years training for this. Uh, it's expensive. It's like raising money for this. I'm telling all my friends, it's going to, you know, here's what I'm doing. It's going to be awesome. And you expect to, to do that. And then to feel like my life is totally new and different and better. And all my old problems are gone. And none of that is true. It's like, no, like all those old problems now look even bigger because you don't have a distraction. They're like now right in your face. You've got all of these, uh, uh, you know, you running seven marathons, in seven days, it's, it's very hard in your body. And so like now I'm in pain physically and then kind of like the mental, you know, anguish of finishing this big goal, not feeling any better, feeling actually lonelier after doing this. Um, that night, I'm in a, a literal like five star hotel, really swank Miami Beach hotel that uh, my sponsors put me up in. And uh, I feel you know, I'm in this bathtub, I should be over the moon, my phone is like beeping every six seconds with another text, uh, or email uh, from someone saying, hey, congrats. And yet I feel like, I'm the man on the moon over here. It's like super lonely and all. And yeah, I want, I knew what would make me feel, what would numb that feeling. Cause I've done that a bunch of times. And in that moment of weakness, try to score painkillers. And it, it was the first time in, you know, seven plus years that I had you know, made that call, tried to do that. And uh, the next morning you wake up and totally uh, just like confused, then embarrassed, then ashamed. Uh, and generally, you know, I actually, I run to process emotion. Like I, I'm not very good when, when you're doing drugs, like you don't learn healthy ways of like emotional, like processing and regulation. And so I like stunted that for seven years, you know, doing drugs and I'm still like learning how to do some of that. And uh, usually I run because that just helps me kind of relax and think through stuff. But I was, my legs are busted. I can't go run. And so I'm feeling like this wave of embarrassment. And it's like, I know like I could totally relapse right now. I don't want to do that. And so I started actually writing and uh, it, it's this, you know, it's uh, one sentence leads to a paragraph, leads to a page. And before I know it, I've got this little short story kind of containing a little bit on the journey. And it just so happens, I have a buddy from college who, uh, amazing guy who he is now a screenwriter in Hollywood. And I, I basically said, Hey, like, I'd love some feedback on this. You know, I'm working through all this and uh, I share it with him and his advice was, Hey, like 
this could be a film treatment. Like there, there's so much to this and you're not alone. And a lot of people could benefit from seeing this. And I, I, I happen to know some people in Hollywood. So like, you know, let me know. And I would love to actually get this in front of some people. And that was sort of the beginning of, of, uh, yeah, of the journey. And that, that was, yeah, March, 2019, that all of that kind of came into to motion. And here we are, no November, 2020, and, you know, still trying to make something happen here. Can I just ask you something? Cause it's, and I hope you don't mind me asking this. It, would you say that, 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 that until relatively recently then, that in a way you were almost addicted to sort of slightly crazy challenges, that that was your latest way of coping and, and sort of getting through and that, the writing has has helped you sort of move away from that. So although you're doing a, an amazing 3000 mile run, it's not because you've got to do a crazy challenge. It's the purpose of why you're doing the run rather than the run itself. Is Does that make sense? I'm just interested in, in how your mind has developed in, in, over the last couple of years, I suppose. Yeah, no, great question. It's so I, I think frankly, I, I am addicted to pushing the limit with running. I think I still am. Um, it makes me feel like alive. It, you know, there's feel like there's high stakes to it, even though it's just me running somewhere, but it feels that way. Um, so uh, yeah, and, and I've, I've learned a little bit about the brain chemistry and that checks out with like the literature that it's very hard to like stop an addiction. It's much easier to channel it into healthier ways. And that's how I've coped is, is running and, and running a long way. Um, uh, that said, yeah, I, I'm a purpose driven person. And I find if I don't have a clear purpose, I get into bad behavior and I do dumb stuff very quickly and very easily. And so, uh, yeah, it, it is wonderful to have a purpose I care a lot about because it just, it, when I wake up, Hey, here's what I'm doing. I'm going to go like, put all that energy into something good instead of something self-destructive or just purely you know, egotistical. So that, um, yeah, that, that's a little bit how I'm looking at it, but you know, part of your question here is, uh, or part of the answer to this is I, for six, seven years was in total denial. So like, uh, it's hard talking about this stuff because of the stigma and because of the judgment. And so it's much easier just to deny it. You know, I, uh, uh, I stopped drinking actually December of my master's year in, in England. And I remember coming back after the holidays and friends, but Hey, like, why aren't you having any port with us? Why not any wine? And I would just, I would lie. Oh, I'm, I'm cutting weight for boxing, which oh, I was, I had to cut weight for the boxing team, but it was also like, I have a problem and I'm trying to you know, move past this, but it's just, it's easier to not have the honest version of the conversation and just give something very surface. And for seven years, I was giving just the very surface and it gets exhausting though, because you can almost sense this person could benefit from actually uh, hearing this and I could totally benefit by just being, you know, my authentic self instead of the sugar coated version of whatever it is. So that, that all has kind of um, been bundled together and been really, really um, transformative for me. Like I feel like I'm in a much better place um, by just being open about it as opposed to like carrying this dark secret around. Really interesting. I'll hand back to you, Ollie. I just wanted to ask that. No, no worries. It was a great question. And it brings me on to my next one, um, which is to do with the fact that with balance, you know, it's very, obviously you have your coping mechanism as running, but you mentioned the writing, you know, that's not just it. There's a fantastic documentary on Netflix called The Mind Explained, which I really recommend. You know, it says that there is no cure to addiction. If there was, no one would have it. Um, it's, you know, a combination of little things. So, you know, addict, getting out of addiction is a very two steps forward, one step back thing. You know, you will have little relapses like the mental relapse, if you can call it that, that you had last year. Mm. What have you got to say for not investing all of your energy, recovery energy, I want to say, in getting out of that hole in one thing so that, you know, if that cushion, for whatever reason, you know, goes away, say, you know, you broke your leg and you couldn't run. If that was all you were invested in, you would have had a meltdown. You know, you've got to you've got to sort of juggle multiple things at once, don't you? That all sort of contribute in their own small way. Total wisdom, right there, Ali, for sure. Um, so yeah, I, I think I've been guilty of like too much, like the one basket strategy, which yeah, for the reason you mentioned, is not as sustainable as uh, as it should be. Um, I've realized during you know we're, we're quarantining here in the states too. It's in fact, y'all have probably seen the headlines. It's it's really bad right now, as bad as it's ever been. Um, we're somewhat sheltered here where I am, but you know, we're still back to lockdown. And um, in the course of that, I felt extremely cooped up as I imagine a number of y'all are. Um, and that's it, the, the silver line to that is I've had to kind of look inward to figure out like, hey, how do I keep my mental health going? 
instead of being able to like travel around and get like all these novel experiences, which was how I used to live before, before all of this. So it, um, uh, yeah, balancing is really, really important. And it's a lot of simple things. So like I found like starting my day by like reading the Bible and like uh, praying a little bit, like meditating a little bit that like sets a nice tone, like staying away from Twitter and the ridiculous things happening in our politics right now has been helpful. Brewing a cup of green tea. Like I, I really like tea after my time in England, uh, green tea, black tea, English breakfast tea, it's all good. Have a cup of tea um, and maybe do a little bit of writing. Uh, and like for like those 30 minutes, like I'm in like I'm in like control right here. And like this wild chaotic world swirling around is not like putting a thousand pounds on my back, um, which you could handle Ollie, I can't. And so it's, uh, you know, got, got to find uh, the sustainable pace. And so all of that uh, is wonderful. And even if I do have a broken leg, I can do any one of those things, right? So. I am trying to find more balance myself. It's definitely a work in progress. I think that's really interesting. T just talk a bit more about that because there are people I'm sure listening and on this call now, and by the way, do ask questions. We'll, we, we can pick them up who are stuck in their rooms. You know, we've got people if, even whether or not they've they're positive, but obviously we've got isolating households and, and it's, it's tough and it's, it's so much harder for everybody, I think, than last time. A, because we've been there before and, and B, because actually it's dark. You know, there's something, when the, light, when the days were getting longer, everybody felt more positive, I think. It is, it is, it is that much harder. Talk, if you can, talk a little bit more to, about, about what would be helpful to people that, you know, drawing on your immense experience, actually, about, about how you are, how are you working on that balance? So you've talked about meditation. You've talked about, in a sense, you're describing a level of structure to your day, I think, aren't you? Yes, I, I am. And, you know, I'm a creature of habit. So I yeah. um, I can do like the same things every day. And I still find like a lot of joy in that, which is probably yeah. different than, than some others. But like um, that, the, you know, creating a little bit of structure for like the morning, here's my morning routine. Here's like what I do after lunch each day. Here's what I do before bed each day. Uh, and I've got like little routines and it's like really, really simple stuff. Like I like to write in my journal before I go to bed mm -hmm. and I like to read a book until I'm really tired. Then I like click off the light. Like those little habits, like that helps me sleep better. And if I get eight plus hours of sleep, I'm not like a total grouch the next morning. I'm not like in zombie mode the next morning, which uh, if I don't get eight hours of sleep, like I am a grouch and I'm like a zombie the next day. So like figuring out like what is like really important for you and hydration for me, like literally like reminders to drink water and tea, um, a clean diet, uh, at least 30 minutes of like exercise and fitness each day. And then these like little habits, you know, writing, reading, I do a lot of stretching because running kind of tightens you up. So mm -hmm. I do a, a number of stretches each day. And then, uh, you know, many of us are studying right now, of course. And so like, what, when do you do your best studying? And when do you do your best reading versus problem sets versus exam prep? And uh, for me, like, because the world right now is so chaotic, a little bit of extra structure in my life has been really helpful, really useful. Um, I'm also very fortunate my parents are nearby, my uh, big sister, her two babies are nearby. So like, we've got like, you know, having family around makes this a lot easier. I know for a lot of us, um, uh, we don't necessarily have family at hand, um, but like that has been a nice deal for me because I've been away for 12 years and I'm getting like triple time with the family after all that time. So um, uh, yeah, finding out what makes you happy and then spending more time doing it is, is the, big, the big thing that's working for me. That's really helpful. Ollie, can I ask you, I know I'm, I'm going to let you carry on, but I, I, I'm not going to let you not talk about yourself a little bit as well, actually, um, because exercise has been and fitness has been really, really important to you for a long time, I think, from what you've been saying in a variety of ways. But you're also thinking very clearly about our community in college as well at the moment in terms of that, because obviously our gym's closed and, and fitness is going to be and yeah. just exercise and fresh air is really important for people. It's just one way of coping, isn't it? So do you want to just talk, just tell us a little bit about you as well and about what you're doing in college? Because I think that'd be good. Yeah, so it's interesting. The reason I asked you about the broken leg, if you were, you know, to invest all your time in running is because that's what happened to me back in January is I was investing all of my time in my training and then I broke my leg and all of a sudden that was all gone and I went into sort of hysteria. What am I going to do about it? Um, and that led me to realize that exercise, you know, overdependence on exercise can be bad. You know, you, you, some people I've met up with mates and they'll be like, oh, Ollie, you're, you'll be so proud of me. I was working out every day in lockdown. I was like, oh, fantastic, because that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. And then they say, yeah, I worked out. I got up at 6 a.m. I worked out then. Then I worked out just before lunch. You know, I only had one meal a day and then I worked out in the evening. I feel so good about myself. I feel in my best shape ever. And I'm like, 
that there's an overdependence, and that's the situation I was in back in January. Um, and so with the broken leg, which is still, you know, stopping me doing what I was doing, I want to help people to find that sort of balance where it is that compartment in your life um, where, you know, if you need it on a daily basis, that's totally normal. You know, endorphin, serotonin, very helpful, mental release, a bit of outdoor, you know, exposure, which is important and for some impossible, sadly, if they're in isolation, but for most of us still possible. Um, so that led me to the idea of a fitness society, which was a pre-lockdown thing. Um, and pre-lockdown, it's called Fitz Pump, um, which is a very weighted name because there was a debate whether it's called it Fitz Pump or Fitz Nurse. And it's like a it's like a Biden Trump situation. 71 million are Fitz, Fitz <laughs> Pump and 70 million are Fitz Nurse. Um, but we've gone with Fitz Pump. And I created it for 10 people to sort of get together in groups of six, obviously, to work out outdoors. Um, and then when lockdown was announced, I put forward the idea to the JMA that they loan out the equipment in the gym. I'm like, it's going to be sitting there for a month. You know, I'm more than happy to note down, you know, who has what, hold them accountable. You know, they pay X amount if they lose or break something. Um, they were like, sorry, health and safety reasons. We can't take equipment out of the gym. I'm like, fine. The JMA very kindly says, we'll be happy to give you some funding um, if there's enough interest. And I put forward the idea and 130 people come forward and say, yeah, I would love for you to do that. All of a sudden the JMA, you know, says, okay, if there's 130 people, I'm not going to say how much they gave me, but really a great amount. And so now I have, and I could, well, my, my, the blueprint of my floor is currently an example. Um, <laughs> I have, you know, a ton of equipment that you can loan out for free because of the JMA's generosity. Um, so you know, this sounds like a promo. It's not. It's for, you know, the people of Fitz's benefit, not mine. If you want to join the Fitz Pump Facebook group, then you can come down to Oxford Road and rent the equipment. And I'm also doing my best uh, Joe Wicks impression with a bit of Zoom circuits, which is interesting from my point of view, but people seem to dig it. Um, so, you know, people well, are more... very important for people who are isolating, isn't it, in particular? Yeah. Well, exactly. And I wanted to ask Greg about, you know, obviously in the first lockdown and in this lockdown, presumably, unless you're in isolation, you have access to outdoor space. A lot of people don't currently have that. Mm. I'm doing the Zoom circuits, which, you know, if you're in a 19 meter squared room, it sort of is and isn't viable. Is there any other advice you'd have for people yeah. who cannot get outside? And that that's so tough. So yeah, for us here, we're able to like go outside and you know, we've got like a forest and stuff. So like it's a different situation when you have that ability. Um, if folks are comfortable with it, I think even getting a little bit of fresh air, like opening a window, um, trying to wake up a little bit earlier. I know that you know, Ingl uh, Cambridge and Bainbridge Island where I'm from are about the same latitude. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we have short days this time of year and it gets shorter and shorter until the 21st of December. So waking up a little bit earlier so that you're catching sunrise has been super helpful for me. I don't always do it, but when I do it, it makes a difference to have that full daylight. Um, and then uh, one thing that actually has been awesome, let me see if I can get this into the frame. Um, maybe not, but so I have this uh, little lamp. In fact, let me unplug it. Um, this guy right here, uh, I press, you know, you can do up to an hour uh, yeah. and it's this like really bright light that mimics like bright sunshine. And uh, I was very skeptical when I heard about this until like, I just, a number of friends were like, no, like you have to try it. And then I did. And it was like, wow, I have all this energy. So I think using, um, and it was like $20 on Amazon. So it's not, it doesn't you know, totally break the bank either. So um, little things like that, in addition to like getting a, a workout, you know, I think Fitz Pump is such a cool idea. And like, I love that. And if, if you're on the fence listening in right now, like do that, that's going to be so good. And like, imagine coming out of lockdown, like being in really good shape, like, wow, that would be a wonderful way to use that. And I can guarantee no matter how good your body feels, your brain will feel better, like getting some fitness in. So Ollie, I, I salute you for the great initiative. This is a hard time, but I think you're going to make it uh, just, it could be a wonderful experience for those that join you in the journey. So I appreciate that. I'm going to ask a couple of people have put some questions on the chat. So should we take those next and then I'll come back to you, Ollie, and you pick it up again. Eleanor, you put one on. Do you want to ask it? Do you want to come off mute and ask it? And then I'm going to come to Julianne. 
I think it was who was it I'll find it anyway Eleanor first um yeah so I guess I I am a runner myself and I was interested really in the logistics of it um especially sort of the the run itself kind of how many days you were you were planning on running and what the time frame is and and how many rest days you sort of incorporate into that as well yeah thank you Eleanor and kudos on your running as well um yeah we uh I'm aiming for about 45 miles per day, which uh, if you math that out, it'll be somewhere between 70 and 75 days of running. Um, my aim is to actually do uh, no zero days. So like even on days where it's lighter, like let's say I hurt my ankle or like my knee's really sore, my aim is to still walk and to be making forward progress um, in part to keep the legs warm. Uh, Cause like sometimes like you can work stuff out with more active movement. And then second, um, I think it's really tough psychologically if you've got 2,140 miles to go and then that number stays where it is like day after day, that can even be, I think, more challenging for me like mentally. So um, that's the aim. There is still a ton to work out logistically and kind of operationally. I am also terrible with details. Like I, uh, you know, if I make a to-do list, I need my first step in any to-do list is like make to-do list kind of deal. Like that's like my level of operation. So I... Uh, uh, luckily, I have a really good team supporting that that we're bringing together. And in the next couple of months, hopefully we'll have more clarity there, Eleanor. And would love to keep you posted and hear more on your running here too. And yeah. a very simple question. Yeah. How much food do you have to eat to run 40 miles a day? That's This is the best part about the entire experience is you can eat as much as you want. So basically letting uh, hunger be your guide. And uh, my aim is to yeah, wake up, have a big breakfast, get moving, uh, have like a big pre-lunch, keep moving, lunch, move, then like kind of post-lunch, move, uh, and then like a big dinner to, to kind of top it. So somewhere between probably 55 and 7,500 calories um, in a day. Uh, and, you know, on the really long, like if it's colder, for instance, you're going to burn even more calories. Uh, it'll get harder. You know, we're planning to start April 4th. So by June, it's pretty hot in the U.S. And those will be harder because it's harder to have a big appetite when you're getting scorched by the sun. So th that'll be a, a particular challenge on the back half of this. And then a question from Julia, has therapy played a part in supporting your sobriety? Julia, wonderful to hear from you and thank you for the question. Um, I, uh, so for seven years, hi Julia, I'm seeing oh, this is a little reunion here with uh, Antonia, Julia and I, this is, this is awesome. Hi um, Greg, it's so great to see you. Oh, no, it's so inspiring. Sorry, Julia, I didn't from... know you, would, you could come on, that's brilliant, very good. <laughs> Thank you so much. No, I'm just so happy to be hearing from you. And I've been following uh, a lot of what you've been up to over the last few years. We did our uh, master's together at oh, different subjects, but we were there together. And yeah. um, I, I, I completely agree that exercise and structure to a day are so important, be it for, to support you in your sobriety or if you have a mental illness or are more prone to suffer from a mental illness, especially now with uh, being more isolated and being indoors more. Um, but I was wondering if, if therapy has, has had uh, a part to play as well, uh, besides all the other good habits that you've been uh, fostering and trying to implement in your life. Thank you. Yeah, such a thoughtful question and, and uh, so good to see you here. I, uh, so for, for seven years, I had too much pride to do therapy. Um, we, have a, we have a big challenge in the States where it's not manly to talk about your feelings or it's not manly to do therapy. And it's, it's, it's very foolish and it's, it's very dangerous because a lot of people that need help don't get it because of these silly preconceptions. So uh, I finally, you know, I was going through a, a tough patch in the beginning of 2019. And my, my buddy, who's a lot tougher and stronger than me, was like, hey, like, you need to stop being so prideful. Like, check this out. And I'm so glad he did because I, I started working with this uh, mindset coach, a therapist who really is all about how to develop like better mindsets. And his specialty is actually working with uh, a lot of endurance athletes. And he could really get through my thick skull. And we've built this wonderful bond. We can talk about anything and everything. And uh, it's been transformative because I now understand more about my own journey and how I kind of found myself into some of these, you know, challenging uh, aspects of the journey. And that didn't make sense until I was actually working with a licensed professional, a counselor who like really, really um, has studied this stuff, really understands it. 
And now I, I have a lot more tools at my disposal. Uh, so anyone that's on the fence, I um, highly recommend you know, seeking counseling because I think it can help us in just a lot of ways to unlock uh, the best version of ourselves. And it's, it's a lot less scary than I envisioned it to be. You know, I thought it was going to be, oh, like, I don't know what's going to happen. This is so uncomfortable, but actually it was, it was great. It was a conversation with someone who like really understands the human mind and can help you better understand yourself. So uh, it's played a big role the last two years and I'm looking forward to building momentum going forward. Two more questions on the run itself. And then I'm going to hand back to Ollie to pick up on his questions. First one, what do you think the biggest challenge will be on the run? Yeah, I think the biggest challenge is the hamster wheel effect. So when you're running through like the state of Pennsylvania, it's a big state or like the state of Montana is a huge state and it, it feels endless. Um, and so it's like, how do you even measure progress? And so I think that will be really, really, really challenging. Um, I think it's going to be really hard. Uh, it's not a question of if you get injured, it's when you get injured. And like, whether that's an ankle thing or a knee or a hip or a shoulder, or, you know, any number of other things, how do you react when you can't run a 10 minute mile anymore? Your best mile is a 13 minute mile or a 14 minute mile. And now it feels way harder because you're going so much slower and it's painful. How do you react? And so ultimately it's a physical challenge for maybe a week or two, and then it becomes a mental challenge. And then even and then your brain's exhausted. It becomes almost like a spiritual challenge of like, like at your soul level, how do you keep digging deeper? And that sort of shifting each gear, I think will be really, really challenging. And that's one where every day I think we can build up so that we're a little bit more prepared for that. But ultimately you got to get out there. You got to take the leap and that part's going to be really tough. Um, but acknowledging it at the outset, acknowledging it's going to be really, really challenging is, is one key step in all of this. And, and, and another really interesting question, I think, about the run. When did you when did you think I can do this? When was when did it feel this is surmountable? How many mini sort of, you know, uh, multi marathons and all the rest? What, what did you go through? What was the process you went through to think, actually, I can now do this 3000 miles? So I, honest answer is I don't right. even, <laughs> oh, right. even now I don't. So. It, uh, it's, it's very, very much, you know, I'm Richard Grants is one of my great heroes. His one of his mantras is screw it. Let's do it. Yeah. And uh, a lot of the things I've accomplished in my life, I didn't even see a path to getting it done until I had sort of taken the leap. And then you sort of figure it out like once you're a little bit closer to the challenge. So my, my mentality is I'm training hard. I'm doing all like the little things well. And this is going to be a, a challenge that is going to be so massive and so huge. But I, I have what it takes to figure out as I do it. And so. Nice. Um, I, I do believe I'm going to make it happen, though I don't yet see that path, if you will. But we're going to we're, we're going to figure it out. April 4th is coming fast and uh, we're going to be ready. So great. Thank you. Ollie. Yeah, just while we're on the um, subject of the run, I wanted to indulge my own curiosity. Um, your 777, the seven marathons, seven days, seven continents. What was Antarctica like for a marathon? Oh man, so amazing. So I grew up reading about Ernest Shackleton, who was like one of my great heroes. Um, and so I've you know, read his logs. I've read the uh, uh, books about Shackleton. So I've been dreaming about this since I was like you know, a kindergartner talking with dad about Antarctica. So it was so amazing, even looking out like the airplane, seeing this just like expanse of ice as far as the eye can see, and then getting down on it. Uh, it's, it's surreal and it's splendor and it's beauty and it's total bleak isolation and the only sound you hear is the whipping wind and the sound of your your boots your shoes hitting the ice and a little bit of crunch with each step uh, I saw exactly one animal and it wasn't like an emperor penguin or something beautiful it was an oversized seagull that lived at this Russian research station and just like eating all like the food they fed it so it was like huge uh for the cold and all but uh so amazing so beautiful and the, the actual race itself was, uh, it was, it was amazing. Nothing like it. You're, it's a big s series of loops around this huge airfield. And, uh, you know, I don't do a lot of loop races. Like it was really wonderful, like seeing uh, all of that. And then the sun is hanging out at like 15 degrees, like just barely above the horizon um, the entire time for hours on end as we do it. So it, it was surreal. It was amazing. And I was only there for you know seven hours start to finish. And so like I, I'm very eager to get back, hopefully do a climb on Mount Vincent there um, and explore more of Antarctica because there's there's so much there. It's 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 huge. And I saw a little speck of it, but that little speck was all kinds of entrancing. 
what are you wearing to run a marathon in Antarctica? Because I would presume you start with layers and then your body heats up over time, but then you you know you take something off, a wind comes, and isn't there a lot of chopping and changing? Yeah, so you start with, you know, I had my Kermit the Frog green suit on over, um, like big windbreaker, did an entire loop, uh, and I was just warm enough at that loop, so I take it off, and then instantly I'm chilled. Uh, and then whenever the wind picked up, you would completely lose lose feeling like all the way to like your elbow. It's like it like goes numb. Your lips, your nose, your ears, even with a cap on, like would, would sort of numb out on me. So it uh, that part was intense, but you know, I expected that. And I, I even trained and I was living in Shanghai at the time, which isn't exactly like super cold. You know, it's uh, it's right above the tropic line, but it uh, um, even in Shanghai, like it gets somewhat chilly in the winter. So like you would train literally just in little short shorts, no shirt, no long socks, no hat, no gloves to, to kind of simulate a little bit of that like extreme cold. And uh, again, it's a mental challenge really above all else. And so mentally being prepared for that chill, when it happens, you're, hey, I've been, re- I've been getting ready for this for two years. No problem, let's roll. And I just want to touch upon something you said um, when talking about lockdown. You said that you cope well with it because, well, not because, but the fact that you are a creature of habit potentially helps. Mm-hmm. obviously here at Cambridge some of us thrive on spontaneity you know difference in our day waking up and not knowing what's going to be in that day lockdown kind of takes that out of the equation so was there anything new that you sort of threw into your life or was there any advice for the you know the more spontaneous or what's today type of people no I think that's a great a really smart point so I uh, I also enjoy you know, sponta- spontaneity. So I call it, uh, this is sort of geeky, but I used to study Navy, uh, I would say foreign policy as a bachelor. And uh, I studied like in the US Navy as it relates to China and like our competition over there. And uh, a little f- framework I came up with was up periscope, down periscope. So a submarine in the old days had to put its periscope above the water to kind of look around. And that's almost like the spontaneity, like when like cool stuff can be interacted to your environment and you can see it and go experience it. And then there's down periscope, where when a submarine's trying to travel quickly or not be detected, the periscope's down. And by nature, this moment in time is sort of a down periscope kind of moment in a lot of ways. Like we can't get out and go explore with our friends the way that we'd like to. Though um, part of how I look at this is uh, it's a wonderful time to actually reconnect with friends that maybe live far away or that you wouldn't have otherwise been able to see. Um, I will frequently make little like, hey, look, let's do a little movie night. You pick the movie um, or let's like both read something and talk about it or let's you know catch up and that uh um that has been really really nice in kind of unexpected ways and added a little bit of serendipity in all while being very covid friendly for not you know transmitting the virus so um that element has been uh useful and then i a lot of people in my community here are hurting especially those that are you know from less well-off backgrounds if you were already just above the poverty line you may have lost your job uh you may have fallen you know on really hard times and so I've, uh, you know, I, I've gotten involved in a couple like public, little like uh, public service volunteer projects, and that's been really meaningful for me. Where I'm meeting totally new people, I'm learning about big issues around youth mental health, around like fire service. Um, really, like our fire departments play a huge role in actually helping folks in distress in America, and learning more about that, seeing how I can be useful and helpful. Um, that has been a little bit of like serendipity plus purpose, which that intersection's been really good for my mental health. Can I pick up a question from Laura? Because that fits that fits really, really well with what you've just said there, which is Laura, Laura says from your experience, what do you think can be done for pre- preventing addiction? Um, I mean, she's saying that what you're saying is is in terms of your personal experience is really inspirational. I think everybody will agree with that. I just wonder if you you obviously say you want you want you're hoping government and policymakers will start to listen as a result of your film, but from what you know and have learned yourself and talking to people, what do you think? What do you think should be being done in terms of, of, of preventing addiction? Yeah, so th- thank you for the question, Laura. Um, the single- no, no worries at all. I don't know if you, if you can hear me, sorry. Yes, no, we can. Thanks, Laura. Uh, Thanks. Well, uh, first of all, Greg, thank you very much for your presence uh, with us today. Thanks for sharing your, your, insp- your, your inspirational story. Uh, I, really, I really find really Im- impressive uh, your story of managing addiction and all the challenges that you've been you've been so far it's it, it's really impressive my congratulations on that and as someone who um, knows uh, quite a few cases of people who are struggling with their own addictions I always wonder what could have what could be done differently 
to prevent people from getting to that point of, of, of struggling because I know recovery is hard and yeah. unfortunately many people struggle with it. Um, and thanks a lot in advance for- Thank um, you, Laura. Laura, thank you. Um, the, uh, I, I've heard this said um, that the you know, addiction is really a, it's an isolating condition uh, most every individual suffering from addiction feels alone, even when they're doing drugs with other people. Like it, it's it's an isolating condition. And so the kind of antidote to that is connection. Um, and and Laura's like, you know, you have friends that are dealing with this. Um, so do I. And the thing that we can do to help friends in the midst of this is to to be there and to be a sympathetic ear, to offer, you know, uh, heartfelt attention and care. Um, that oftentimes can be the thing that kind of directs someone toward a healthier choice in that moment. And even when it doesn't, even when your friend then goes and does something that, you know, we wish they didn't, they still remember, hey, like Laura is there for me and Laura cares about me. Laura wants what's best for me. And in the moment where they're able to, you know, listen to kind of their better angels, they will remember that and they can seek out, seek you out or seek out resources or counseling or treatment. Um, and you being there sometimes can make all the difference. And, and we don't actually ever know that because, um, you know, these things work in mysterious ways. But ultimately, connection, I think, is the single most important thing we as friends and family can do. Uh, and trying to be as non-judgmental as possible because nothing feels worse than, you know, you're making mistake after mistake. And when someone you care about is then like leaning into you, giving you a reprimand, like it, it, it not only doesn't help, it, it makes you feel worthless. And it, it, you then want to go find stronger drugs because you feel like a total bomb over here. So that um, connection I think is the, the key thing and just love, care, kindness um, go a lo much longer way than you'd, you'd ever realize. Thanks, Greg. Ollie, back to you. Yeah, I just wanted to touch upon something I said actually about the whole, obviously exercise is a positive compartment at its best. Um, you could argue at its worst, it's either total dependence or non-existent. The... Having struggled with exercise addiction myself, the difficulty was when knowing it was, you know, a healthy kind of dependence. Are you waking up and thinking, okay, I'm going to start the day off with a 30 minute run or a weight session or whatever, start the day off right. Where's the line in terms of then sinking into that pit where all of a sudden, I don't know, say it's all you're thinking about or your whole day revolves around it and, you know, you're making sacrifices that you shouldn't be making. Mm. and how do you notice that happening i guess is the other part of that isn't it that's exactly it yeah yeah, yeah. so one um good question and you know I've, I've definitely felt myself on the other side of that line many times um one thing that's helped me is um every saturday i call it strategy saturday where you know i, I work a lot i train a lot and so i try to take one moment to kind of step back and before i go play with my nieces or hang out with my dog I'll spend like 30 minutes to an hour looking kind of at like the stuff I'm doing, like at a more like strategic level. It's like, hey, am I putting my time and my resources into like the right areas or, you know, what, sh what needs a little bit of tweaking? And, and I found for, from a training perspective, that kind of keeps things on the rails because I'm able to say, hey, last Monday wasn't actually challenging enough. I want to make that a little bit harder with my training or, huh, I, I spent too much time Wednesday, Thursday, Friday out running. I need to pair that back so I give myself a little bit more time for work stuff or for rejuvenation or for sleep. So um, I think actually taking like a more of a strategic look and like looking at actually how you're spending your time. I'm a big calendar guy. So like I can look back at where exactly the time's going. Um, uh, that is really useful for me because otherwise I start getting into autopilot and I make horrible decisions when I'm on autopilot. I, I really try to be more intentional and proactive or else I literally spend hours a day on Twitter, like reading about the outrageous things happening in our government. And so that's not healthy for me. That does no good in the world. It just makes me frustrated, you know, and like, uh, you know, anxious. So uh, it helps me to kind of be a little bit more proactive and strategy Saturday is the way that I like to do that. I think one of the dangers of autopilot as well, if I can just yeah. contribute is it, you know, if something like exercise or whatever you might be addicted to, it could be gaming or something like that if that's unquestionably a part of your day yes then your autopilot won't go out and look for those new experiences that we thrive on and you know mm. if you're on autopilot and you think okay i'm you know living day to day i'm going fantastically it's like you can be living without actually properly living 
and just doing the mundane things you were always doing, but just staying there. Mm. Ollie, how did you recognize that it was becoming too, too sort of dominant? And, and how did, what, what, you know, how did you pull yourself out of that? Honestly, mine was easy because I looked in the mirror. Um, I came to university with something resembling a jawline and through eating 6,000 calories a day, which Greg can do because he's running marathons, I'm, you know, doing heavy squats and bench press. And so I'm not exactly burning that many calories. I just looked in the mirror and I'd gone from a 70 kilo undergrad to 115 kilos. And all of a sudden I was, you know, I couldn't, that's the why I broke, that's how I broke my leg because my body literally could not take the force. Um, mm. And so that was a nice, easy wake up call. But to be honest, the problem is, and this is why I wanted to know Greg's thoughts, is the damage was done a long time before. It was the mindset. The mindset was the difficult thing um, because the mindset had gone 10 months, I would say, 11 months before that, mo that moment where I looked in the mirror. And a lot of damage can be done in 10 months or 11 months. And like, if I hadn't broken my leg, I genuinely would probably have been in more or less the same situation now. And that's not a good situation because I felt an obligation to keep going with what I was doing, partly because of what I'd already dedicated to it. And, you know, my coach at the time, I said to him, look, I'm, I'm miserable at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I had all these elite aspirations and he was just like, look, if, you know, I'm making all these sacrifices, I'm, you know, I'm teetotal, I'm not going out, I'm not, you know, partying, doing any of that. And he's just like, if you want to be elite, you make sacrifices. And wasn't really the thing to say, because, I, you know, for two more months, I lived by that. I was like, right, this is my goal. You know, I'm putting that, you know, emphasis on this one goal. And the broken leg was the wake up call, because all of a sudden, like I touched upon earlier, that goal was removed in that split second. But what was weird is when it was removed, I was I was like, oh my God, everything I've been working towards is done. So when I looked back, I was disappointed. When I looked forward, all of a sudden it was a relief. I felt liberated. I, there was no obligation. There was no pressure. And I think maybe that's the lesson to take from it is it's when you start to feel an ob. You know, every day I felt a duty to train. Now I want to train because I know that it helps me with my mindset. And I know that, you know, an hour a day is not an unreasonable amount of time. I mean, Cambridge week five, sometimes an hour a day is not something you have. But, you know, if that desire to do it is there and, you, you know, you question whether it's due to your desire. And this time last year, I would have been saying something very different. Um, it was certainly duty. Then I think for me, that's the fine line. I mean, that's really interesting and very honest of you. I, it just makes me wonder how we can have that conversation more widely across college to make sure that people you know are doing are doing it are doing exercise and, and, and or involved in sports and they because because they love it but also that we've got the necessary support mutual support for people i think it's i think it's a really interesting issue actually well that's exactly it and i think you know having talks like this from greg you know it encourages that openness because yeah. greg's one example i'm a diff i'm another example yeah. two very not niche because obviously addiction happens, you know, to so many people, but in so many different ways. And say someone is addicted to gaming and is on this call, you know, they probably think, oh, this doesn't really relate to me. It does, it yeah. fully does. And, you know, this level of openness is probably what's needed because there's so much stigma around it. It's almost a taboo. Yeah. Um, and, you know, me giving my example, Greg giving his example, it's fantastic to encourage people to open yeah. up, but, the problem with addiction is you will look for an excuse to not listen. And unless you can relate totally, I think that excuse is enough to sometimes turn a blind eye to it. Mm. And so I, for me, it's just that openness. Like I say, my example, Greg's example, fantastic to have out there. Yeah. There'll be people in college right now who can't necessarily totally relate and that'll be their pretext for continuing. Mm. Well, it sort of underlines the fact that we've kind of got to very consciously look out for each other, I think. Sort of, you know, just just be there. Just be there so that this, we're open to people being able to talk. Yeah. And Fitz has always had this phenomenal community. And I would say that COVID has brought that out more than ever. Mm -hmm. You know, out of any college in Cambridge, I'm happy to be at Fitz. Mm -hmm. 
mm. a time like this because I think our community is just phenomenal. Mm. No, well, I think people have been have been have been really good at giving support to each other, but it gets harder, I think, doesn't it? It's. I tell you the one thing, the thing that I'm sure we've all taken different different sort of bits of your of your talk actually Greg and sort of different tips almost I tell you the thing I'm going to do I'm going to look at the sunrise I loved your sunrise thing actually I think I think I think the idea of sort of starting the day each day with that is is fantastic and I suspect between us we'll we've taken lots of different things away what I'd like to suggest is that um it'd be great if we can kind of follow you as you're doing your film. So if you can stay in touch with us, give us the link so that, because I think a lot of us would be really interested in, in, in following us up. And maybe, I don't know, if Greg's up, if, if Ollie's up for it and Greg's up for it, then it'd be, it'd be brilliant to, to do another one of these in the future and just just to, 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 to tell us how it was and you know what you went through actually and share the experience. I, it'd be an honor. Uh, this is so cool connecting, having a chance to share a little bit and, Super appreciate that. I'll be sure to share links. Um, I, I, I share updates on Instagram, uh, Greg runs far. And then uh, we do have a little film website where you can kind of stay tuned there. So I'll share those links and immensely appreciate this opportunity to, to connect and to share. And thanks everybody for tuning in. It's a, it's a tough time, but one step at a time is, uh, is the formula. Thank you, Greg. I mean, it was it was fascinating and, and, and brilliant. Of you. And thank you too, Ollie. And thank you for being so honest as well and open with people because I think it's, I think it's really, really, I think it's really hard to do. And I think it's really important. So thank you very much for, for both your journalistic talent, but particularly actually for, 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 for sharing your experience too. Cause I think it's really, it's really important that we do. Oh, that. 100%. So, and it's such an interesting topic. And yeah, once it's done after April the 4th, I'm more than happy to chat to Greg about it again, see right. how it went. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you everybody. Thanks for joining and, and, and see, see you all around college. Bye-bye. Thank you.